So uh, Tracy, it's lovely to see you here in Penn State again, and really appreciate your taking some time to uh, talk with me about these questions for the Center for Online Innovation and Learning. So we have three, and they're kind of sequential. The first one is, um, where do you see, with all the changes and the forces in the field, where do you see education being in, say, relatively short time period, three to five year sort of window? Well, the strength of American education is also its weakness and its diversity. So it's very difficult to answer that question in a singular form. Mm. I think that there are uh, some schools that are struggling now. And unless they take some very innovative paths, uh, they may not make it. So one place that I see education going is uh, there will be fewer schools than we have mm -hmm. today in three to five years. I think schools that uh, either have a very strong brand and, and are very solid in the field uh, nationally and internationally uh, will continue along that path. But how and in what ways they continue and what they look like in five years, I think, is the question that senior administrators, presidents, boards uh, need to take a close look at. So there are some trends that I think that uh, would help. Uh, certainly globalization must be met. Mm -hmm. And uh, the early shot, let's say, has been in MOOCs. But I, I think that's uh, not going to be the last shot. I think uh, international, inter-institutional course development uh, for both faculty uh, in the uh, learning and teaching space and then also in research is probably the initiative that I would make where I'm in a position of uh, senior leadership. Uh, no matter if I were at a research one or even at a small liberal arts uh, institution, uh, it is something that we must do in the United States to get yeah. out of our parochialism and uh, recognize that the rest of the world is, is not only competitive with us uh, at an economic basis, but we are collaborative because higher education, that's what it's all about. So I just want to pick up on one small point because I'm just curious. When you say that there may be some schools in three to five years who aren't going to be here, um, or, or maybe at that point sort of on their, their downturn, mm -hmm. what do you see as the pinnacle issue? Is it about brand? Is it about identity? Is it about mission? What will be the thing you think that might tip it one way or the other? Well, again, Larry, it depends on what kind of school it is. Mm -hmm. uh, the pressure that the Obama administration has put on some for-profit institutions, I think has been very appropriate. Uh, some have misinterpreted that pressure to suggest that he is against not-for-profits uniformly. I don't think that's correct, and if you look at the literature, uh, you couldn't possibly come to that conclusion. What he objects to is something that I think every person who is a fair-minded person and cares about education at its heart would also object to and that is predatory for-profit colleges that have taken advantage of the weakest students. So we are talking about people who have been in the military. They are heavily marketed and moved to these for-profit uh, colleges that uh, really aren't designed to help the student. But they put them in tremendous debt and leave them with little to move on mm. after their decommission or even while they're still in the service. Those are the kind of institutions that I do hope fall off the map Good point. because Good point. Uh, they are not a complement to uh, the missions, mm. for-profit or not-for-profit, being right. irrelevant, but the missions of educating our citizenship. Oh, there are other schools yeah. that, that are very, very well intended. They might be for-profit. They have been around for, you know, in some cases, decades, if, if not over a century. If you don't make yourself relevant, you won't make it. My yeah. dissertation was on Catholic women's higher education in New York State. And it extended just about the full century, and I'm expanding the years a little bit to say a century, but uh, uh, there were 13 of them. Some of them were the schools that uh, were very highly regarded, the Manhattanvilles, the Marymounts, the uh, New Rochelles. And they had different strengths. Uh, and then there were nine others, uh, some of them in local areas that uh, when they transitioned uh, were disestablished from religious roots that were becoming anachronistic, although fabulous at the start as part of the acculturation process of Catholic American women to the society uh, from a middle class basis. Uh, if they transitioned properly, take Nazareth College in Rochester, transi transitioned very, very well. Uh, but if you take a college like Manhattanville, if, if you were to go on that campus today and ask uh, a student or even faculty member, what was the origins of this college? What were the roots, yeah. Yeah, except for a statue in the, in the quad, they, they, they may not even know it. Wow. It was a real crash. So um, it, it, 
it's not the first time that higher education has gone right. through tumults. Right. And I think the question is, what kind of institution is it? How is it operating relevantly within the political economy, not only of the United States, but of the world? And does it have a vision to uh, see itself going forward? Very good. Great. Thank you. All set? Great. Thank you. So, right, let me ask you my second one. Oh, <laughs> well, I beg your pardon when you said, OK, thank you. That's I thought okay. that was it. Uh, so my second question has to do with what are the barriers uh, for achieving a, a, a new type of educational ecosystem in the United States? And just one or two that maybe come to top of mind for you. I do think vision is probably the first barrier on the positive side. If you really do not appreciate that we are in a 21st century global information economy and working to prepare students for that world, you probably are going to be handicapping yourself. Yeah. Now, uh, what that means uh, can be across the board. Uh, certainly institutions that do engineering and computer science, they, they uh, wouldn't sit on their laurels, I don't think, but they would be seeing how and in what way the technology and science is moving in that direction. In math, by the way, it's one of the most lucrative undergraduate degrees sure. to get now because of intelligence and business analytics. Right, right, right. Uh, if you're not an institution with strong STEM, background, there's still an enormous amount of curriculum work that you can do to bring people into consciousness of what kinds of jobs and what kind of world we live in. So live out that liberal art mm -hmm. tradition of sure. critical thinking, uh, self-conscious awareness, mm -hmm. and domestic and global citizenship can be done at the least STEM, most traditional sure. liberal arts school uh, out there. So uh, I don't think that there are categories as in Carnegie class. Mm -hmm that are going to uh, be fully realized a research institution with math and science or small liberal arts colleges that uh, you know, maybe lack those strengths. It's really being aware of the political economy in which we live in and training your students with digital literacy, information literacy, and the 21st century information economy in which we live. And if in any direction that you can uh, do for them very traditional work for citizenship, critical thinking, global awareness, uh, you're going to have su successful students and you're going to have a successful institution. Very good. And it goes back to a word you used uh, a little bit earlier about relevancy. Yes. So I love that. Yes. Uh, so by the way, the second, uh, 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 what did you say, obstacle or something right. like that. If, if your institution does not have a good heart, if it is predatory, mm. Get out now before we make you get yeah. out. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Good. So a good heart, yeah. I think, will also make a big difference. So the program that we're connected yeah. through is a, is a leadership development program. Yes. And um, I'm wondering what you see in this in the emerging context of online learning and uh, higher education, the changes. What are the skill sets that tomorrow's leaders are going to need to embrace in order to be successful? Well, I think they need to em embrace technology and distance education, no matter how it fits within the institution. So for example, if uh, a Research One University right now is experimenting with MOOCs, I hope that they're keeping their eye on how it will turn into blended learning. Mm -hmm. It might be a terrific outreach, uh, a great service that they're offering the world. Mm -hmm. It will help with marketing and branding of the institution. It will give faculty a sense of, of position in place. But in and of itself, it's not going to last. Yet using it as the leverage for moving forward and how we're going to work uh, technology and distance education into blended learning, I think uh, is really where it's at. And again, that would be for research or it would be for a, a, a liberal arts college. The skill set, though, that you're talking about is one to be able to see the opportunities that, say, a MOOC type experience Absolutely. offers and then figure out so it's, it's nimbleness, it's agility, it's all of those things to be able to say, well, how does that, um, how does that become relevant to who we are as, a, as an institution and as a mission? Yeah. Yes, you know, I'm curious about this word. Uh, it's used so frequently about nimbleness. I, I think that uh, uh, institutional leaders have always had to be nimble. If you look at the 20th mm -hmm. century, the changes, uh, technology, social, political, Sure. The rise of the, the American century and what that meant for research and higher education and the role that higher education played in it. Yeah. Uh, if you were not nimble, uh, you failed. 
I, I can give you, once again, my dissertation, you know, as an example. There, there were schools where there was nothing left because they were largely irrelevant given a number of factors. I know that that's, that detail isn't what you're, you're yeah. interested in here. I use it only as an example to say nimbleness has always been with us. I think that what lies under this uh, term of nimbleness is an awareness that things have changed both qualitatively and quantitatively. The internet, not as a technology, but as a world historical phenomenon, mm -hmm. is relatively world historically unique. We have had other great leaps like this with the printing press and then aviation and some industrialization. But we are living in a very unusual moment. And so uh, it, nimbleness is, is a more generic term. Mm -hmm. I would say that people must educate themselves about what it means to be in a global economy that is run on information and through internet technologies in such a way that then they can readapt what their mission is and, and what service they want to provide within their institution for it. That's what's different right now. It's a qualitative shift and, and the quantity of it being truly global and especially as mobility reaches out even to some of the uh, most developing countries uh, is, I hate to use a, a, a hackneyed term, but is a game changer. And that's what people have to be aware of. So I wouldn't say it's kind of nimbleness in some generic sense. It's, right. it's nimbleness because of these specific shifts. Yeah. It's um, if what you're describing is an intentional nimbleness. Yes. I love the thought that you're, you're saying, Tracy, about that, uh, that underlying awareness, the need to be um, conscious of, of these changes and forces, and then figuring out how does one move within that space. Absolutely. Yeah. And you can do it whether you're a small liberal arts college in the middle of the continental United States or in the middle of India or in the middle of China or South America or Australia or any place else. And you can do it as a very large university. Very good. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Thank you, Larry. My pleasure, pleasure, always. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.